the last day of Jesus. And uh, just before his death, we already read where he was in the upper room. And in the upper room is where many call the Last Supper. And Jesus said, you will, uh, he will not take of the cup or the bread again until we see him in heaven. Uh, in that moment, in that time, Jesus knew they only had one day left. Jesus was dead by Thursday. And here he was, his last day. And like many of us, uh, and I've, I've experienced this myself, been uh, with people who knew they were going to die. And the words that they want to say to people, uh, things that they want to tell them. One that sticks out right away is my grandfather. When my grandfather was dying, he called me in, wanted me to do his funeral, um, which was a great honor. That was his plan. Uh, I even asked him, this is how my grandfather is. I asked him, I said, what, what do you want me to say? And I meant, is there something special you want me to say? And he looks at me and he goes, if you don't know by now, I'll find somebody else, right? That's my grandfather. But his last words to me, and he brought people in one at a time to talk to them. Uh, his last words to me is the reason he wanted me to do his funeral. He said, of all the preachers he's ever known, he goes, you're the only one I've ever known that really believes this. You really believe this. Um, that has always stuck in my mind that my grandfather, being a Snyder, and it's a blessing and a curse, uh, we, we are brutally honest people, um, Snyders are. And uh, so he was being brutally honest. That stuck with me. And then there's like deaths that come all of a sudden. My uncle died this week. Uh, there was no goodbye, no last words. So those who do know that their end is near, they want to talk to people. They want to tell people their last words, their last lessons of life. And they're usually ones that you remember because it's a dramatic moment. Uh, and I know that sometimes you need a dramatic moment to startle you or get your thinking right. Uh, I remember one time, I pinched Jonathan real hard. And he goes, Al, he's not here. He can tell you. He goes, Al, why did you do that? And I said, because the next words that come out of my mouth, I never want you to forget. Sometimes we need a certain moment. And here's Jesus, his last day. He knows it. His disciples are very confused about all this. They're, they're not when he's talking about dying and going away and, and, and this is the end, they're very confused. When he talks about being betrayed, they're, they're super confused. Uh, what do you mean your last day? You're going to die. We've seen you raise people from the dead. Uh, this, you're not going to die. But yet he was. And I did not know this, but when I started doing this study, uh, I tapped into something major about the last day of Jesus. And uh, I might even do a book on this now. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is just like scratching the surface of the last full day of Jesus and what he taught and what he did and how significant it was, even up to the point where he said, I thirst. And then he gave up the ghost. So much happened in that day that's significant. And it wor it's worthy of a study. We're going to study the last day of Jesus and what he taught his disciples. He's about to die. And so he wanted them to remember what he's about to teach them forever. He never wanted them to forget this. One of them we saw, we find in 
Uh, John chapter 13 in the upper room. I'm just going to kind of tell the story. We saw the video. There he was in the upper room. The Bible says he began to wash the feet of the disciples. Now, that was amazing in itself. And, and that's a lesson in itself. But here he is, and we saw that, the king of the universe, the creator of everything, lowering himself to be a servant to others and wash their feet. I did not know how humbling that is until one time at camp, we were doing a lesson on this, washing people's feet, and I asked uh, a friend of mine to come up and I was gonna wash his feet to give an example, and he takes his shoes. It's not easy washing somebody's feet. It's not. Uh, it's a humbling experience for the person being washed and the person who's doing the washing. It's a little embarrassing. Uh, we got through it and everything, but I mean, that was the only time I've ever done that. And imagine doing 12. Imagine doing one person, and as you're washing their feet, you're looking in their eyes, and this person has basically already betrayed you. Already sold you for 30 pieces of silver. And that would be Judas. But Jesus still what? Washed his feet. You don't, I mean, there is no way the disciples ever forgot that moment. Even his enemy, even the one who was going to betray him, had already sold him, just had to go through the formality now. And Jesus knew it. And he still washed his feet. And so that's a dramatic thing of itself. But as I began to study this, I saw where the disciples asked Jesus questions and he gave them answers on his last days. Now, he's no, this is his last day. He knows he's about to leave them. He's about to die. So this is what he wants to remember. They want them to remember. Forever. And so he could have answered the question in so many different ways, but he wanted to make sure they knew this lesson before he left. We find the first one in John chapter 13 and verse 8. And it should say um, 8 through um, 10. First, I'm not, what am I saying first John? John chapter 13, verse 8. Peter said unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. So here he is. He comes to Peter and Peter says, you're never going to wash my feet. Now, Peter thought he was doing the right thing, saying, you're the you're my Lord. You're my, you know, Lord. You're my rabbi. You're my teacher. You're not going to wash my feet. I should be washing your feet. Right. But Jesus wanted him to remember something. He wanted to teach him something. And Jesus answered him. If I wash thee not, thou shalt have no part with me. He said, Peter, if you want to be my disciple, let me wash your feet. And that's dramatic. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He said, Peter said, okay, if that's what it takes, wash all of me. Wash what Peter was taught at that time was to submit to God. Submit to God. Peter wanted nothing to do with his feet being washed from Jesus. Nothing. And Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, submit to this. And of course, Peter said, okay, then I'll, I'm all in. I'm all in. We as Christians will face things we don't want to face. We'll have to do things we don't want to do. We will. And we'll say, God, I want no part of this. Nothing of this do I want to do. I don't want to face this hardship. I don't want to go do this. I don't want to do that. Missionaries have to submit to the will of God to go to foreign countries where their children may die 
and have died. I was in Mexico and knew a missionary had buried two children there. Knew a missionary who went to Africa and buried three or four of his children because of snakes, each one of them because of a snake. And people would ask them, do you not love your children? Don't you love your family? Why would you put this in, in this situation? And some of them would even say, and one man would tell you, this is not what I chose for my life. I never chose to go to Africa. Never wanted any part of it. But this is what God asked me to do. And just like Peter, who wanted no part of it, you submit to God's will. And he wanted all the disciples around to know what it is that God wants to do. Submit to it. Or you're not my disciple. Oh, you'll get to go to heaven and, and, and you'll be in heaven, but you're not a disciple. True disciples of Christ try to follow God's will in their life. And Peter said, OK, do all of me. I'm all the way in. If only we could get a hold of that as Christians. God, if this is what you want me to do, I'm all in. Not half in, not part in, just a little bit. I'm all in. All of me. My family, too. We're all in. It's an amazing thing. So here he is. Jesus is about to die. And the first lesson he wants to teach to them, besides humility and being a servant, is part of that humility and being a servant is to submit to God's will. The next lesson is from John. John himself. John chapter 13, verses 25 and 26. 25 and 26. What had happened is Jesus says, one of you are going to betray me tonight. Well, we all know who it was because we can look past. The disciples did not know. And they were asking each other or each other and asking Jesus, is it me? Is it me? Who's, who's going to betray you? Even Judas said, is it me? It's amazing how... Uh, Lying ties into being betrayals and, and traitors. They just fit together. Is it me, Jesus? Well, Jesus already knew. And John, now it says here, and we know from other scripture, and we know uh, the style of the book of John. John did not like to mention himself. He did not mention himself in the Bible. Says he was lying on Jesus' breast said unto him, and that would be John, we find in other scriptures, Lord, who is it? So he's laying on his breast. He looks at the Lord and he says, who is it? Now, Jesus wanted to teach John a lesson that John will never forget because this is his last day. And Jesus said, he, is, he it is to whom I give a sop. And when I have dipped it, and when... He had dipped the sop. He gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So we learn from this. Those you serve will betray. He dipped the sop and he gave it to Judas, serving Judas. He had already washed his feet and he given something special to Judas right now, serving Judas, serving him food. John, look at this. You'll serve people and they'll betray you. If you've been in ministry very long or in ministry very long or any kind of ministry at all, you'll find people that you help will end up stabbing you in the back, lying about you, betraying you. It happens. Did that stop Jesus from his ministry, from his purpose in life? No. Did it stop him from loving Judas? No. Did it stop him from loving the other disciples? No. Here was Judas. He saw all the miracles that all the other disciples saw. He, saw, he heard all the lessons and, and all the 
sermons that Jesus had taught, all the other disciples had heard. And Jesus served him like the other disciples. Those you serve will betray you. It'll happen. It'll hurt. There will be pain. But you go on. Because he had 11 who did not, right? I mean, that night they kind of ran away and all that. But in the end, they even died for him. And so you'll have those who will betray you, talk bad about you, lie about you, stab you in the back. And Jesus even said one time, if they hate me, what do you think they're going to do with you? And Jesus wanted John to know and the other disciples heard it and saw it. Those you serve, those you minister to, not everybody you minister to will be thankful. I remember helping at a community uh, center in uh, Chicago. We had a community center that we had ministry with. And uh, I worked all day baking this, these uh, biscuits. And, and they're more of a roll, not a biscuit. You, you tell people that was a biscuit down south, they would look at you weird. So there were rolls and we're passing them out. And this is for people who are homeless and they need food. And we're passing them out. And one woman said to me, do you have jelly? I said, I'm sorry, we don't have jelly today. And she took it and threw it back at me and hit me. And said, who, who serves biscuits or rolls? And she said biscuit too. Who serves biscuits without jelly? I was stunned. I, lady, I've worked all day. I, I didn't tell her this, but I've worked all day baking these rolls these biscuits just for you. And you, I, you can't be appreciative of just a little bit. I mean, we had butter, <laughs> but no jelly. She will not want anything to do with it. There will be people you'll minister to. They will not appreciate it. They'll cry, but they'll complain. Look at Jesus. He healed uh, 10 lepers. How many came back to say, thank you? One. If you're in ministry for the pat on the back, if you're in ministry just because you want people to like you, if you're in ministry for people to love you and talk of how great you are, get out of it. Because you're not going to get that. You're going to get a lot of people saying, I would do this way, I would do it that way. Uh, a lot of people griping, complaining, uh, I wouldn't do it this, I wouldn't do that. Yet they're not doing anything. People that you minister to, they're going to gripe and complain about how you do it. I remember picking up people on a church van. Somebody has to get picked up first, but nobody wants to be picked up first. Here I am, I'm doing a service for you. I'm serving you. I'm picking you up so you can go to church and all you want to do is gripe and complain because you're picked up first. Somebody has to be. And then they want to gripe and complain because I take them home last. Somebody has to be. That's what happens in ministry. It can get frustrating. It can hurt. There can be pain, but it cannot stop us from being faithful in what we do. John, those you serve will betray you. They will. The next one is Peter. Peter had two lessons in this. Uh, found in 13 verses 37 and 38. Probably the, one of the most traumatic, dramatic lessons from Peter. By the way, I love Peter. Peter could have made a good Snyder. Peter just says what comes in his mind. He's just brutally honest. Sometimes he's way off. Sometimes he's right on the mark. But Peter is brutally honest. In verse 37, Jesus has just talked about the being betrayed and he's going to be taken away. He's going to die. And, and, and the disciples are not having any of this. And Peter says in verse 37, Peter said unto him, Lord, why can I not follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. He said, I would die for you. 
Peter says, I will die for you. We read in other scriptures where Peter says, if all these other disciples betray you, if everyone else runs away and betrays you, not me, Jesus, not me, I'll die for you. Sometimes I wonder if God laughs at us too. Some of the things we say. And God knows exactly our hearts. But here's Peter. God knows what's going to happen. Jesus knows what's going to happen soon. He says to him, I would lay down my life if all the others run away. Not me. Never. And Jesus says to him in verse 38, Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down my life, thy life for my sake? Basically he's saying, oh, will you? Oh, really? You will? Very, verily I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me three times. And we all know that happened, right? Three times he denied him. But yet he brags and says, I would die for you. But when a little girl asked him about whether he's a follower of Christ, he got scared. He got scared. Do you also, and this is a side note, did you notice what he tried to do to prove that he was not a disciple of Christ? The last time he started cussing. Because Christians aren't supposed to cuss. Just thought I'd throw that in there. Those who declare themselves more loyal to God then all others will betray God. Those who say, and they won't say it, but a lot of them portray themselves as some kind of spiritual superstar. Spiritual pride. Those are the people I fear the most. Seeing them in any ministry I've ever been in, People even talk about how spiritual they are. If you want to know how spiritual they are, just talk to them for a little while and they'll tell you. Those are the people who doubt other people's salvation. Who are you? I really doubt that person's saved. Basically, they're saying they're not as spiritual as me. So therefore, how could they be a Christian? I really doubt that person's called of God. I really doubt it. And that is never, it's never ever, ever, ever slipped my eyes to see how they portray God. Every stinking time they do. You know why? Besides the pride, we're all sinners. We are. Be careful of those who set themselves up as some kind of spiritual leader. And they'll tell you so. And that the Holy Spirit talks to them in some kind of way. Be careful of that. That person has spiritual pride and they will betray God. They will betray God. Do you guys remember that it says in the Bible... That, the Satan, that Satan, the devil, is the accusers of what? The believers. And those who make millions and millions and millions of accusations and accusation after accusation on other Christians or believers, be weary of them. What work are they doing? It's not God's. It's not God's. And that's why the Bible says to take care of your own problems before you go out and help others. And your own problem is spiritual pride. Here was Peter. Peter said, if all the other disciples desert you, if all the other ones, and he's already accusing them and saying that they're not as spiritual as he because I will die for you. Will you, Peter? Will you really? No, you won't. And neither will anyone else with spiritual pride. They'll destroy other people. They'll destroy ministries. But not die for Christ. And they're full of spiritual pride. And Peter, 
Don't forget this lesson. And he learned it. As soon as the cock crowed, he saw. Thank God for Peter. He repented of his sin of that. Became a humble man. And was used mightily of God. But was he used mightily of God before that? No. And never would have been. Because of his spiritual pride. Be careful of people going around doubting other people's salvation. I really don't think they were saved. Who are you to say that? Who are you to say that? I really don't think that they even have prayer time. I don't think they really talk to God. I don't think they follow God. Really? Who do you to say that? Mr. Spiritual, Mrs. Spiritual Pride. And I've always seen these people betray God. I've always seen it. Because before there's a fall, there is pride. Thomas learned a lesson. John 14. John 14, verses 5 and 6. Jesus says, I got to go. I'm leaving. But you know where I'm going. Thomas says in verse five, Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whether thou goest. How can we know the way? Jesus says, I don't want you to forget this lesson. I'm going. I'm going away. Thomas says, where and how do we get there? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the father but by me. What is the way to salvation? There's only one way. That's Jesus Christ and his sacrifice. No man can earn his salvation. No man can be declared saved by any other organization or people. Only your faith in Jesus Christ and his salvation shall save you. And Jesus, Thomas, learn this lesson and learn it now. I'm the way. And that's how you get to the Father. No one gets to the Father but by me. No one. Do you think maybe Thomas remembered that lesson the rest of his life? Do you think maybe he taught others when they say, how can I get to heaven? Let me tell you the way. The way is Jesus Christ. Thomas learned that salvation is only through Jesus and his sacrifice. Philip, he learned a lesson, John 14. John 14, verses 8 and 9. And Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it, and it suffice us. Because Jesus is talking about the Father here, and he's saying, can you show us the Father? Show us God. Show us God the Father. And Jesus said unto him, have I not so long time with you? And yet, hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Philip, I am God. I am the Father. Philip, I've been with you all this time. You can't see that I'm God. Have I not had healed blind men? Have I not healed leprosy? Have I not raised people from the dead? Have I not told people what they were thinking? Philip, I'm God. I am the Father. Wow. What a lesson. Do you think Philip forgot that? Because this is Jesus' last day. In his mind, in his heart, I'm hoping in the three days that Jesus was gone, Philip goes back to that conversation. He said, Jesus told me that he was the father. He told me that. And then in the resurrection. It all came true, right? Philip. I am God. Number six, Judas, not Iscariot. How would you like to be known that for the rest of your life as a disciple? Judas, not Iscariot. I think I would change my name. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't want to be called Judas at all. 
Judas, not Iscar uh, Iscariot. Uh, turn to Ju uh, John chapter 14, verse 22. And uh, 23. Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot. Lord, how is it that thou wilt manify thyself unto us and not unto the world? How are you going to manifest yourself to us how, how, and not to the world? What do you mean by this? What? And Jesus said, this is a lesson you need to know. Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will what? Keep my words. And my father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. If a man love me, if a true disciple of Christ, if a true Christian loves God, he will what? He will be compelled to obey God's word. How do we know if you love God or not? You obey his word. That's how we know. When we disobey God's word, it's not out of love, is it? When we lie, is that out of love? No. Maybe love of self, but not love of God. When we steal, is that out of love? No. Not a love of God. It says, if you love me, you obey my word. Thomas, that's, I mean, uh, yeah, Thomas. No, I'm sorry, Judas. That's how I manifest myself in you and not the world. The world does not love me. We know that. Do they obey my words? Never. But Christians show their love of God by obeying the Bible. How does, a, how does a son or daughter show that they love their parents? Hugs and kisses, yeah, that's, that's all great. You can give me all the hugs and kisses you want, but if I have to bail you out of jail all the time, that doesn't go very far. You can give me all the hugs and kisses and write little hearts and all that stuff you want, but if I'm constantly going to school because you're in trouble, that doesn't go very far, does it? Same thing with God. You can say, I love God. You can show up to church and talk about how you love God and all that. And that that's not what Jesus says to Judas. He says, you show you love me by obeying my word. How does a child show that they love their parent? By obeying them. By respecting their commandments. That's how they show it. So how do I show I love God when I read it? I do it. And that's how a Christian shows they love God. What a lesson Judas had at that moment, the last day of Jesus. The next one is to all the disciples. They all had a question. Let's turn to John 16, 18 through 20. John 16, 18 to 20. Then they, they said, therefore, what is this that he saith a little while? We cannot tell what he saith. Now, when Jesus knew that they were uh, desirous to ask him and said unto them, do you inquire among yourselves of what I said a little while and you shall not and you shall not see me. So he's telling them in a little bit, in a little while, in a few hours. You're not going to see me again. I'm going to die. And I mean, what, what do you mean in a little while? Slow down, Jesus. Wait, what are you talking about? A little while. And ye shall not see me. Verse 20. Verily, verily, I say unto you that ye shall weep and lamb it, but the world shall rejoice. And ye shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. Jesus says, listen, yeah, I'm going to be gone and it's going to hurt and you're going to have pain and you're going to have confusion and you're going to have sorrow. But guess what I do with sorrow? 
I can turn it into joy. The rest of the world is going to be happy when I'm gone because there's I've given them an opportunity to become Christians, to get saved, to cleanse them from all unrighteousness. And so will you eventually. He teaches disciples, your sorrows will bring joy. All the pain and the hurt that we go through as Christians, and it will happen. You will have sorrow. You will have loss. You will have pain. But Jesus is telling us as disciples of Christ that sorrow can turn to joy. Listen to me. Everything you go through in life, every pain, every anguish, every heartache. You can help others through that pain. Do you think you're unique and and you don't go through the same pain as everybody else? No. No. And there will be somebody someday. They're going to go through the same pain, the same heartache. They may lose a loved one. They may lose a child. They they may get some kind of disease. And you can go up to them and say, hey, I went through that. And this is how God got me through it. And you can give them hope. You can give them peace. Isn't that a joy? To be able to use our pain and our suffering to help others. It brings joy. Not only that, sometimes we go through pain and suffering and we pray and we plead to God and God answers our prayers and has a miracle. And what joy that is. Jesus said, listen to me, disciples, your pain and your sorrow can bring joy. I remember seeing the movie. uh, I can't remember the name of it now where the boy breaks through the ice is brain dead. And his mom and his dad and all of them were praying. His church was praying. He he was dead. Finally, they made the tough decision to unplug him. And God brought a miracle. Not only was he alive, he could walk, he could talk. He kind of asked about what's going on. A miracle. From sorrow comes joy. Always. Whatever pain and suffering you've had or going through, do not become bitter. Do not become angry. Allow that to be taught to you and learn your lesson and get through it with God so you can go and tell others the joy that can come in the end. The peace and the hope. Jesus says to the disciples, you're going to be sorrowful because I'm going I'm going away. I'm dying and it's going to shock you because they're still not getting it. Then the last lesson, John, chapter 16, verses 29 through 33. And his his disciples said unto him, Lo, now speak thou plainly and speakest no parable. Said, just, just tell us up front. Be right. Don't talk in riddles. Tell us up front. Now we are sure that thou knowest all things. And needest not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou camest from God. Now, what's the lesson Jesus wants them to learn? Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come and ye shall be scattered. Every man to his own and shall leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone because the father is with me. Verse 33, these things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Jesus says, and he's probably inside laughing a little bit. They said, we believe you're from God. He goes, 
You believe now when nothing's going on? You've never had temptation or, or trials or tribulations like you're about to have. You say you believe now? We're about to see that. Nothing in this world strengthens your belief in God more or weakens it. It's up to you than troubles and tribulation. It's up to you. It can either destroy you or it can build you. It's up to you. Many a time things have happened to me and I've had that prayer. I say, God, don't let this crush me. Don't let this destroy me. Let it build me. Jesus says to them, because they're about to scatter. They're about. Now, they scattered because of some Roman soldiers coming and getting Jesus. Later, they're really going to scatter because people are killing them. And they're going to have to go hide. Some Christians even hide in, in graveyards. In tombs called the catacombs. You really believe in me? Do you believe me in tribulation? But he promised this. You will have troubles. But during your troubles, you can have peace. And I know that's weird. But that's what he promises. Right in the middle of all the disaster that might be going on. You can have peace. You can come to church while you're in torment inside and pray and sing and say it is well with my soul. There will be tribulations. There will be troubles. You live in this world. It will happen. You will have sorrow. But Jesus says to his disciples, don't forget this. Never forget this, he says. I can bring you peace in the middle of it. Do you think maybe they go back to when they were on the boat with Jesus? And the storm came up and all he said was what? Peace, be still. Every one of these disciples, including Paul, die horrible deaths. None of them ran from it. None of them. I remember and we're about done. During the Colosseums of the Romans. They used to take women and children, Christians. And set them out and let out hungry lions and hungry bears. And the people of Rome would sit around and watch these filthy Christians. Get torn apart and eaten by lions and bears. They would take untrained men, Christians, and have them fight against gladiators, just trained soldiers from the Roman army, and watch them just tear them apart and cheer because they're just filthy Christians. But as the soldiers who had to take these Christians and put them in the middle of the Colosseum began to see peace that were in these Christians' hearts and minds and their eyes as they were about to be slaughtered. Many a Roman soldier asked these Christians, How? Why? <laughs> Do you think maybe it went back to the disciples who taught people, Guess what? In the middle of your troubles, in the middle of your sorrows, you can have peace. And millions, well, I don't know about me, thousands of Roman soldiers became secret Christians because of that. So much so, later on, one Caesar sees it, he understands it, and all of a sudden make Christianity the national uh, religion with cheers from the Roman soldiers. All because of the peace that God brings in the middle of torment and torture. 
lessons that God wanted us to get on his last day. He wanted his disciples to remember it forever. So much so it's written in his word and we can remember them also that submit to God's will. Those who you serve, they will betray you. Those who declare themselves more loyal to God than all others will betray God. Salvation is only through Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. Love for Jesus compels you to obey the Bible. Your sorrow will bring joy. And you will have troubles. But during your troubles, you can have peace. The only question is, are we willing to learn these lessons that Jesus wants us to learn? Let us pray.